the spirit of reconciliation, we are theatre and Theatrical Aloud acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Hey theatre fans, one and all, this week we are walking down the aisle, we are going to the Wedding Singer Musical currently in Melbourne, then coming around Australia, we are here with Stephen May, uh, who plays Glenn. Hey Stephen, how are you going? Yeah, good thanks mate, how are you? I am really excited to have a chat about this show, um, I'm a huge Adam Sandler mu- movie fan, so um, this musical is obviously like an encapsulation of everything I love all in one. Um, yeah. First of all, do you want to talk about your character and your role in the show? Yeah, so I'm playing uh, Glenn Goulia. And Glenn is a money-hungry, uh, like, power broker. Um, grew up in Jersey and has gone to Wall Street to find money and has landed some great deals somehow. Um, he's not a very smart man or a very nice man. Um, essentially, he's the villain of the piece, uh, the the two people, obviously, Julia and Robbie, the main focus is on them. They meet, they're friends, and they develop feelings for each other. But Julia is torn between this sort of world of Glenn with money and material things or love and romance. And so if you have seen the movie, I'm pretty sure you know what happens. But uh, if you haven't, yeah, there's this sort of, this sort of tug of war of uh, like what she kind of wants. Um, and so we try to empower her and Glenn does everything in his mind to um, take away that power. Uh, whether he's doing it consciously or not, he is, he's the douchebag. And it's a very interesting character to play because I guess I don't, I don't ever get cast as the bad guy, um, yeah. but I've done, this is the second musical in the eighties now that I've done that it's, I'm being typecast. So it's, uh, <laughs> I've got a thing but that's it. it. <laughs> yeah, I've got a thing. He's, yeah, he's nice sort of uh, thick Jersey accent, very, very much a power man and, you know, thinks the world revolves around him. Yeah. Um, speaking of the eighties, stepping back in time, going back to that style of music and everything like that and getting to encapsulate the eighties on stage. What's that like to kind of, revive that entire era in a musical yeah from from the moment we we kick off you feel like you are back there like you hear the synthesizer you you see the colors you see the lights and the choreography really just snaps you back into that world it's very nostalgic um and a lot of people when they come and see the show they're like oh it's just love it um you know the 80s was about self-expression and a way to you know break the norm of what was going on in pop culture um art especially was really vibrant and really poppy so you do know exactly where you are immediately and to hear those different sounds within the musical is um it's hilarious because you just you know like you know i had a cassette player or i had a cd player or the new mobile phone in america was you know a cellular phone you could take anywhere and it was the size of a, a brick um yeah, so it's it's really fun to go back there and see, kind of discover again. You know, I was born in '82, so I was a bit, a bit of a, you know, a little fella going through those times. But just see how influential pop artists like Madonna and Prince and Sure and you know, countless people, obviously. But it was yeah, extraordinary to um, just to see how much influence they had on culture. Yeah, amazing. I love that. It's such a like interesting thing because right now we're seeing a lot of modern musicals come to stages that are set in either futuristic times or current times. We now, obviously Hamilton way back when, but with a modern yeah. vibe. Um, but to get that kind of, not historical, but um, recent past kind of vibe on a stage is kind of different to see, I guess, um, which is nice. Um, yeah, and it's not so far back that it's sort of so far removed from a lot of people. It's our generation or, you yeah. know, um, our parents' generation were like, oh, the 80s were just so much fun and carefree. There was money and like the world was kind of, you know, seemed a very kind of like innocent place because we weren't all connected by the World Wide Web very easily. And there were so many things that kind of were innocent about it, but yet very, very corrupt. Yeah, and you guys have had the chance to have some audience audiences in and get some reactions. So what's it been like hearing um, people's reactions to this show so far? Yeah, The Wedding Singer is definitely a comedy piece. And so it relies very much on that audience response. Um, We absolutely vibe off it. Like we encourage people to yell, scream, like have a laugh, um, have a cry. 
So definitely, I mean, there's nothing really beats live theater in my my opinion. It's it's hard to sort of say, nah, it's not worth it. it absolutely, is worth it. Like yeah. a musical, which I'm so grateful for it. But every night there is a different audience, and every night is a different kind of heartbeat that goes with the show. Yeah. Um, and that's what we have to trust as performers that we're still doing our job properly, even if people aren't laughing in the same spots. Yeah. Um, but it, because there is different generations of people that see it, different jokes land as well. Yeah. So sometimes people are like, oh, I definitely understood that. Or they go, huh? So yeah. you just have to play into your strengths and just trust that you're doing the right thing. I think that's a the fun and tricky thing about um, being in a comedic piece is that it's not the same thing every night. In standard musicals, pretty much you know certain things are going to resonate with audiences throughout the night and you get the similar reaction. But with comedy, it's very dependent on audience interpretation and how they hear what comes out of it and then you obviously have to adapt to that um and being the villain in this how does that work on your end yeah i, I mean i think <laughs> i can hear the audience cringe in some of the things that i say <laughs> uh and because it's just this jerk uh, and i'm not necessarily a funny character there are funny moments um that i have there it's um it's really, it, it is really interesting coming in and sort of breaking that comedy or breaking what is going on because people just get a quick snap. They're like, oh my gosh, okay, he's saying that. Or, oh my gosh, he's exactly like this villain or this chauvinistic pig. Because um, he really talks to Julia like she's it's like, come on, you'll be right. Come on, you got, you've got this. And so it's kind of demeaning. Uh, and especially in this day and age, like we've learned a lot about, you know, <laughs> uh, inequality and what's going on. So I, I, um, I have a role to kind of play in the sense to show what men are really like even today yeah um and some of it's funny but it also just crosses that line and i just have to sit in that a lot more because personally i am not like that and i'm absolutely yeah. some nights i come off and go oh i'm so gross yeah. um but yeah it's 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 a lot of fun playing that, that's for sure yeah let's go down that road just because that type of thing is in the news a lot especially in the musical theater scene right now um having to portray that on stage what is your understanding and how did you develop that um character but also that understanding um with tegan and everything like that so it's not a it doesn't feel personal like it's a very character on stage persona type thing that you're putting forward yeah so it, it is definitely a conversation that you have sitting around a table and like seeing what the piece is and addressing issues that, you know, there was certain lines that we've changed and certain things that we've uh, wanted to think about. They had more like um, Alistair had a great chat with, with Tegan, Kirby and Holly. Um, so Kirby Burgess, Holly James and Tegan Wooters uh, in regards to kind of things that like just don't sit very well now or can be like, why are we saying that? Like, um, one particular line was changed in the sense of like, oh, you look hot. And then she's like, really? And it said, no. And it's like, well, we don't need to say that. Like, it's like, oh, good to see you. And so we, instead of just, you know, flipping it that way and it's like, really good to see me? No, it's not. We don't have to be misogynistic all the time. And we can certainly have the liberty to change things. Um, I'm very much what I spoke to Tegan a lot um, about the trust that we had. Um, I've worked with Tegan before. Um, 10 years ago and it was very much okay like this is what's going to happen uh, we had a coach come in for the intimacy scenes and we spoke about that and it was very much of can I can I put my hand on your shoulder yeah. okay yes can I put my arms around you and so we've now have the tools and coaches to be able to talk through this and explore it in a way um, but it definitely just comes down to rehearsal communication between the director and myself uh, communication with the rest of the team as well so everybody observing is saying is seeing that it's not Stephen going in there and yeah tearing up a, a like a piece it's it is definitely the character and there is room like you've still got a script and you've got to stick to your script but there's room to be able to explore who we are as people and who Glenn is as a person so I think yeah it it's a long conversation <laughs> yeah, I love that so let's Dive into like the rehearsal um, process and everything like this, getting your hands on this work and music and everything like that. Um, seeing the show come together, especially coming out of COVID and everything like that. Was it, What was it like to be in this room and be able to get creative with people um, after such a long time away from it? 
It's incredible. Uh, we set up an amazing room um, with Alistair and Mikey that it was all about having fun and playing and just throwing offers out there onto the onto the um, onto the floor. Um, I think everybody is so excited to get back in the room and not do a, a Zoom acting class or do an audition again. Like I auditioned online um, via Zoom and then I did a self tape. So there was all these things online and it was like, okay, so I've not met anybody or played with anybody in the room yet. Um, so when we got in there, I was just open and it's probably the first time in a long time where I've had the liberty to be, you know, I'm going to try five different things and see what happens. Yeah. Uh, and because we were creating our own show, like our own version of the show, we really did have a liberty not just to walk on and stand on four. Like we were like, no, no, like maybe I'll come from stage left today or maybe I'll come from stage right. Let's see what um, works for all of us. Yeah. Um, and like with the cast that we have, it was just so liberating that everybody was so willing to just be like, yep, yes, and yes, and let's go. Hey, how about this way? Can we try it uh, a little softer or can I try it a little harder? Um yeah. And I've just been having fun. And I think that's kind of what the aim of the game is anyway, is just to have fun with what you're doing. You know, like it's very cliche, but I'm hashtag grateful for just having a job. But yeah. then but being able to come in here and I do this sort of big seven minute number at the top of act two called All About the Green. Uh, Mikey Ralph choreographing. I'm not naturally a dancer, but he gave me time. He showed me the steps and let me created that character within um, my movement style and now I'm doing it like and before I'd be so scared of be like oh my god I've got to dance and my shoulders would rise up and now it's like well I'm not I'm certainly not a dancer there's there's an amazing ensemble of dancers in this show that are killing it in every number but I feel like I've got this new sense of freedom about playing in shows now and that it could end like we could get an outbreak today and like get a cancellation show's over you're not going to the Gold Coast in a few weeks so I don't know. I just want to go out there and have gone out there with the audience and in the rehearsal room just to have as much fun as I can because I've, yeah, I've never experienced anything like a show closing down and just losing everything. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just, just taking each day and just being very, very blessed. And I, I know it sounds cliche, but it, I really am. No, it's really interesting that you like, you guys think about that. Like obviously it happened with um, a couple like come from away guys and the frozen guys in Sydney um, prior to you guys yeah. opening. Um, but it's just interesting that you actually have that front of mind that, hey, this could potentially be our last show. We don't know what we're going to wake up to tomorrow. Like, it's a very yeah. interesting world. Um, let's dive into 2020. What was 2020 like for you um, with the pandemic, getting locked down um, and everything like that? Yeah, at, at, at the beginning of it, I went into a bit of a panic. Um, I, I didn't – I'm not used to stopping – <laughs> in life I'm, i love a hustle and i love to 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 find work where i can and and work really hard at it so to kind of be put in my place and not have control i was like oh wow like this is something i've really got to address in my personality <laughs> um and it was hard like working through those moments um in the year was hard i was in melbourne i wasn't with my family and friends um so i really felt that um, sense of loss because after the th first lockdown, I was like, cool, I'm going to go to Sydney and see my family. Cause wow. Like, you know, uh, what an experience. And then we got locked down again. That second time really played on, I was like, look, I've got to get a job outside of theater. So I worked for Telstra and I ended up, I was just working from home in a call center job, uh, which is very confronting in the sense of I failed. Am I, am I a failure? But Realistically, it was just the situation that we were all in. Um, I wanted to earn some money. And so that's what you got to do is get a job and get out there. Yeah. I did on reflection, learn a lot about myself and found the ability to find some peace, uh, find that there is an abundance of things that you can get if you allow it. Yeah. Um, you know, we all talk about, you know, yes, ask the universe and the, it shall you know, give, provide you what you need. But unless you do that work, you're never, ever going to get that. We can talk about it till the cows come home, but we're always going to be sitting here with walls up and, you know, uh, being very protective of ourselves. And yeah. I think, and then getting to do the show, like 2020 just sort of proved to me, like you need to live with your own light uh, completely turned up. And if other people are dulling your light, then you need to like question that 
you know, it, it just shows like the people that turned up in your life are there still. The yeah. people that didn't turn up or didn't um, provide, and, and not in a selfish way, but just in a sense of going, you know, like, what are we doing? Like, I don't want to do, I don't want to do surface stuff anymore. I want to be in there and I want to, I want to be real with you. It's like, you know, how are you going today? Like, fine is, if you're just fine, that's fine. But like, I want to know, you know what? I'm not feeling very well today, but like, we don't need to talk about it. I'd go, awesome. I respect you so much. And I'll say the same thing. Hey, I'm pretty shit today. Yeah. Or I'm actually amazing. I'm having an amazing time. And if that's okay to too, like you should be able to have an amazing day. Like here we are doing a podcast. I'm having an amazing morning. Like how yeah. great. I, I, I found that too. Like 2020 was a huge like reset button. I think like it was a massive cool look at everything around you, analyze it, figure out what you don't need anymore because everyone's going to move through this at different paces at different times and yeah. you can figure out where you're sitting. Um, yeah. and communication was a big thing for me and emotion and everything like that. And working through all of that was just, it was a very interesting process, um, mentally for myself. So, um, it's just interesting to hear other people's kind of takes on, um, what they went through and how they handled everything. Yeah. I mean, I think, look, if you looked at society and what was going on around the world, you know, the black Lives matter, um, rally happened because of George Floyd of, you know, just another number or another thing that happened in the States. But also, you know, I chose to go and do the rally here in Melbourne um, for the lives that are lost um, in the detention centers. It's like, how many, you know, at what point did I sort of go, do I have to protect myself and the community? Did it have an outbreak of what it was? It was a risk. I know, but like it really making you stand up for what you believe in. Yeah. Um, and prioritizing that, like it, for me, the industry, we spoke, touched on it before about the respect of what's going on. Like it, inequality is absolutely rife through our industry. Um, what has just happened recently with um, the girls coming out, talking about what happened during Rocky Horror Show. Um, and, you know, yep, he's been proven not guilty, but the judge certainly said if he was tried in another time he would be guilty yeah and i i am certainly very very passionate and angry about um the the sexual harassment the rape culture um not just within um, our industry but within like you come to i moved to melbourne a few years ago and it was like every other week a woman was raped killed um sexually assaulted um followed on a tram and i was like what the hell is going on like and it happens all around the country. <laughs> what, what's going on? Like, why am I in Melbourne and this is just on my feed or I'm seeing it on the news? Like, we, you and I, as men, white privileged men, have a responsibility to stand up and make, uh, start calling, calling shit out. Like, calling your mates out and saying, you can't say that. Yeah, like, 100%. and as much as it's locker room fun, that's what lots of people say, oh, I'm just having a good time. No. Not okay. <laughs> it's not okay anymore. Um, so yeah, like I, I've really sort of gotten behind a lot of things and listened and, and uh, doing a lot of learning. A lot of people are like, why aren't you posting on social media? And why aren't you saying this? And it's like, my social media is an echo chamber. Like yeah. it's people that are kind of already converted, but it's the generations above us that need to hear it. But it's also education for the younger people to say, if you're going to come into this industry, you need to pull your socks up and there's going, I'm going to call you out on your shit. Yeah, that's, it's, it's so good. Like, and I have never felt so confronted um, as I did in 2020. It really, I had to learn about a lot of things because I didn't realize how sheltered I was from certain things. Like the amount of research I did throughout the Black Lives Matter movement and then um, just with certain things popping up with that rape culture and everything like that and the sexual harassment, it was just like, cool. Am I doing anything to hinder progress or am I doing anything that is not right by standards or is there ways I'm approaching things that I need to adjust things so they're not perceived certain ways by certain people? Like what am I yeah. doing that's wrong? And what, what did you do in that? Can I ask the question like, what, what are you doing? Cause maybe I need to learn that as well. Like, is there something that you're doing or a group of people that you're talking to? Yeah. It's just, it, it was very interesting, like having to reflect on, not only my own personal stuff, but those social things that I'm like, cool, why have I never thought of this? Why have I never gone out of my way to make sure I'm up to date 
on all this information? Why am I having to do so much learning now mm. um, on a topic that I shouldn't have to learn about? Like it should just be a natural instinct. It's, a, it's our privilege, right? As, yeah. as white males, we don't need to think about a lot of things. And it's, I guess that's the, uh, that, that's, that's why <laughs> we, we, we don't, we've not been taught to be scared or we've not to protect ourselves because the world is made for us. Exactly. It, it just it's such an interesting time and just all those social movements just really a massive reset um so taking all of that and yeah. going into a fresh cast how different did you approach this show did you find yourself thinking about things more or did you approach your processes differently um going into wedding singer after 2020 um, I think I've already had a, a, a pretty good moral compass in before going into the wedding singer. Um, it wasn't last year that sort of taught me that. I did a cabaret show in I think it was 2019. It was called A Time to Love, and it was it was exactly about that. Like I um, learned a lot of it probably in the last sort of four to five years about feminism and what that's like, you know, and I'm, I am a feminist and what that stands for. And I've had a lot of backlash from like friends or people online. Um, so I think that I've always approached um, going into a show with care and love and understanding and uh, being equal. What I probably did with this show is very much have the conversation with people about who Glenn is and yeah. You know, everybody understood that, but I said in front of everyone all the time, like, this is not okay. What we're doing is not like we are telling a story through this part, but, you know, it was about what asking the other person what they needed, what they wanted from me. Um, I called it out in rehearsals and said, we need to have a conversation. We need to have an intimacy coach. We need to sit down and talk about the, the issues that are here in this piece. Um, I don't think we dove... Um, deeply enough into that conversation because we had about two and a half weeks, but I, I've certainly encouraged it around the cast now. Um, and I'm probably a lot more liberal. Like, I'm just like, you know what? No, yeah. <laughs> no, you can't say that, you know, like, and um, not intentional racism that happens. Like I call it out in, you know, not intentional misogynistic behavior. I'm calling it out. Um, yeah. I, I think if anything from last year was just like, gave me the confidence to be like, well, no, you, you're allowed to say things respectfully. Yeah. You're allowed to do that. And to be honest, I'm with the powerhouse bunch of women in this show that are like, they're calling shit out. Yeah. You know, they, they are, they're, they're doing it. And I, and I support them and I stand by them because some people are going to say, Oh, this is just repetitive. And I'm all I'm hearing, like, I'm not meaning it. I'm not doing the wrong thing. It's like, well, you are. You are. If they're uncomfortable and you're not feeling, they're not feeling safe, you're doing the wrong thing. Yeah. If you're feeling uncomfortable because they've called you out, that means you're doing the wrong thing. Like if you yeah. feel that way because someone said no, then switch up your game because you're doing the wrong thing straight away. Yeah. And that's just not about like, this is not all just about sexual harassment, bullying. Um, you know, it's, it's everything. Like we should, we should lead with love. We yeah. should lead with no fear. We should lead with no judgment. And if you do that, as much as it's very hard, and I'm not perfect, I could certainly have an ego and it gets in the way all the time. But I would want people to call me out and I would want people to tell me what I'm doing or, and, and because I can't, absolutely will be wrong sometimes. But so everybody is. Yeah. It's not just men. We're like, And it's not just women. Like it's, it's society. It's the world. It's the way that we've been brought up. It's learnt behaviours from our past. It's things that we've been affected by like you may be guarded and may be brash because you've had something happen to you but it doesn't still give you an excuse to treat other people yeah in a terrible way so you need to unlearn your bad behaviors you need to go and speak to a psychologist you need to go and do your meditation every every day you need to find those things that are going to ground you and say okay things have happened to me or things i've done the wrong thing but i'm willing to learn i'm willing to adapt and understand what's going on and make a difference yeah like no matter how old you are or how young you are, you you have the capacity to lead with love. Yeah, I love that. It's such a good, powerful message. I'm so glad we got to have this conversation. I've been waiting to have this conversation. I'm so glad I got to have it with you. Um, obviously, being away from theatre for an extended period of time with shutdowns and that type of thing, what was it like going back into a theatre for the first time? I think I scrolled through and saw you saw Pippin 
what was that as like a performance uh, as a performer that's been away from the industry what was that like going back in to that space and seeing live art for the first time just it was mind-blowing because i came out of you know two lockdowns here and i did two weeks of quarantine in sydney and i came out and sydney was already like they were rolling they had been for months and so that alone was like, Ooh, what's happening? Uh, there's a lot of people here. Uh, but I was, I was just, it was, it was heartwarming to see that, you know, the New South Wales government had gotten behind GFO and they put on Pippin um, to see your friends on stage again and to see the hard work. Like that's a pretty hard show to just slap up in a few weeks. Um, going into the audience for the first time was a little scary because you're like, okay, uh, I've not been in this kind of area. And I thought there'd be, you know, it's my mum and I just sitting there watching the show, but it's like no other people are there. And so, you know, uh, it was it was amazing, of course. Uh, and I think it was just a trial and error from the end of last year. And I think everybody going to see it just appreciates going to theatre. I, I, I'm definitely one that claps and whistles and has a great time regardless of what's going on. I think you just have to support them. Um, if I don't like it, I don't like it, I'll leave. But um, yeah, no, it was it was wonderful to go and watch. I love that. Um, just it was such an interesting experience heading back into theatre with everyone masked up and all the yeah. procedures of getting in. It was just a very, it was like, cool. I'm going back to the thing I loved, and my first show back was Frozen, and I remember hearing the overture of Frozen start, and I just sat in my seat and I was like, okay, we're back, <laughs> and I just like <laughs> almost started crying, just of like, yeah, cool, all right, we're back on our feet, awesome. Yeah. Yep getting to post the stuff on social media that I did, but still having my friends in the UK and the US react to us having theater back. And they're like, oh my God. And I'm like, yeah, things are like back to normal here. Like hopefully it gets back to that way for you. Like we've got shows left, right and center. We've got online productions. We've got physical productions. We've got sellout theaters. It's just an interesting time for the world of theater. And we've just a couple of weeks away from West End and a, a couple of months from Broadway opening, which is good. So we'll have full forces back but just to be in that space knowing cool this is one of the first hubs of theater reopening in the world and i'm here to be a part of that is just really cool yeah i mean we we're very much in a very privileged situation and it's not taken for granted at all i think by australians and by people that are doing the show um day in day out and i think it's given the opportunity for the overseas creatives to come over here and um you know get their kind of expression back and their you know way of living i know that a lot of people yeah it, we all missed it i mean i can't believe broadway has been shut for this long you can imagine the tourism that they are just losing money like yeah it's lost it's not coming back um so yeah we, we've certainly given them the world a, a great opportunity like same with korea and um you know you had the cats go over there you had phantom running during last year yeah. um so, you know, other countries were doing it, but we certainly have now, we're on fire, and especially with the movie industry, TV and film are up and running. Um, yeah, we do, we're doing pretty well. As a performer going back into the industry, what was it like having to adapt things for COVID procedures and everything like that? Obviously, auditions online, but once you get back into that room, what was the kind of um, discussions around those safety procedures just to make sure everyone was safe and healthy? Yeah, so masks were, you know, mandatory going into a new venue, getting your temperature checked um, and discussing, you know, we've got sanitizer everywhere and different props and different touch stations. Um, the advice from the government at the time that we started rehearsals was a little less than what other shows were doing. I know other shows get um, tested every week. They have a COVID test every week. Uh, we don't in The Wedding Singer um, at this point because we've not needed to. Yeah. Um, but it's very much, you know, going. we went to Adelaide first and Adelaide are very different. So they've not had cases there for a very long time. So we all got off the plane, ripped our masks off. And, you know, do you need to wear it in the Uber? No, we're fine. You're in the safest place in, this, in the world. <laughs> um, but definitely the com we, have, we have conversations weekly. We get updates immediately if there's been a case announced um you know there was one in melbourne that was announced i think was announced here and so people like you know just to make sure if you're going to be on public transport just do your due diligence yeah. um the whole sort of common cold thing is really hard now because yeah. obviously if you have those flu-like symptoms you should go and get tested um don't come into the theater and you know let us know how you're feeling um after that that's the discussion you can have because a 
if you have a common cold, you still shouldn't come into the theater. Uh, you still should stay away because one person gets sick, the whole cast can get sick and no one needs that. <laughs> <laughs> That's very interesting. Um, let's get back to the show. Um, perform yeah. the show night in, night out. What's your yeah. favorite part of getting to put the show on? Um, oh, there's so many. I, I, I just think, I mean, getting up any show is a mean feat. Like it's a, a testament to David Ben in this time, who's the producer, to take a chance on a show that, I don't know, like I'm just sort of like the wedding singer, the musical. How is this going to be received, you know? Um, it's 80s, sure. It's nostalgic. There's a lot of original music in here. So people like, do they are they going to know it or care about it? Um, so he's taken a great chance. So just to be able to back his... Um, his confidence of what the show was going to do is, is incredible. Um, and doing it for an, a live audience every night is just amazing. You know, like we just, we're in the Athenaeum and it probably seats about 800 people and you've got a full house in that place. It's cooking. Like it's, it's the best vibe ever. Um, the fact that we are doing an eighties nostalgic piece, it really, I, I think that's all it is. It's very nostalgic and you have, have a lot of fun. Um, the show itself I think has some important messages in there. I think that they're not necessarily into in what we are representing of what today today's world is, but it's certainly a a moment in time uh, that we can we can relate to. There is a love story um, loosely tied in there. Look, I don't I don't necessarily agree with the message of the show, <laughs> uh, but I could say the same thing about Mamma Mia and uh, you know Rocky Horror Show or different shows that you kind of go, well, what are we saying? Like, I am. What are we doing? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, it's not rocket science either. It's just a fun night out. It's silly. It's fun, um, and kind of like what the eighties was. It's just kind of just the tongue in cheek humor. Um, I think what is inspiring is seeing the choreography and the ensemble absolutely smash it every night. Um, and we're led by, you know, Tegan Wooters and uh, Kristen Chirisiu, who are just, um, they're nailing it. Um, there's other people on the show that obviously do a great job, but yeah, those two are really, um, they're on fire. Yeah, it's a big show. Perfect. You guys are packing up in a couple of weeks to head to the Gold Coast and then coming down to Sydney. Um, for those people that are sitting, listening to this right now or scrolling through social media and seeing Wedding Singer this, Wedding Singer that, um, umming and ahhing about buying tickets, what's that one piece of advice that you have for those people listening right now? Oh, go out, buy a ticket. It is um, it's a, it is one of those fun nights out. It's very nostalgic. Um, get yourself some 80s gear and just dress up and have a good time. It's not about, uh, it's not rocket science, as I said, and it's not a, a brain buster. It's two and a half hours of fun. And um, yeah, come and say hi afterwards. Wonderful. Stephen, that's going to wrap us up for this week. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, there was a lot of stuff packed into that half an hour, guys. And thank you for sticking around for those guys that are here. Um, if you guys want to get tickets or anything, any info on The Wedding Singer Musical, head to weddingsingermusical.com.au right now. You'll find all the information on casting, shows, whatever the, the lot is there. You can click in, buy everything, and I will definitely be there. So make sure you grab tickets because I am 100% going to be coming and seeing this show. Um, to wrap things up fully, um, what is your favorite moment in the show? Uh, look, it's a very selfish moment, but it's all about the greens. So top of act two, uh, you get to see why Glenn is the way that he is. It's a big seven minute number um, that Robbie goes to Wall Street to find some money and he sort of like wants to have a bit of meaning in life. Uh, and I just think it's one of those, yeah, the whole whole ensemble is with me as well. So it's a pretty red hot, red hot piece. Amazing. There we go, guys. Thank you for joining us this week on the We Are Theatre podcast. And we will be back next week with a brand new episode. See you later, guys. Bye. Mm -hmm.